titled Geodesign and Disaster Resilience of Cities, Leveraging Urban Planning Instruments with Morphological Analysis to Manage and Mitigate Natural Risks Along the Coast. I'm trying to say that with one breath is still a challenge. <laughs> um, my name is Emilia. Um, I am currently a master's student in urban informatics at Northeastern, um, but I will be working with um, the Institute of Urban and Territorial Studies at Catolica, um, as well as a research consortium that is funded by the Chilean equivalent of the National Science Foundation, as well as ONEMI, which is the Chilean equivalent of FEMA, and uh, their Ministry of Housing and Urbanism. It's called CIGIDEN, which, stands, which is an acronym in Spanish for the Research Center for Integrated Natural Disaster Risk Management. It has the objective of preventing natural hazard events uh, from becoming disasters. We'll get into that later. I'm working under line six, but it's a relatively interdisciplinary um, group. But we're looking at citizen governance, which is essentially how to apply the science to policy. Um, I'll be working, my main research sponsor is Dr. Magdalena Vicuña del Rio, and uh, as well as Dr. Carolina Martinez, who is the research lead of line six. And there's just their, uh, their kind of research aims on a beautiful graphic. Okay, so a little bit of history and context. I'm gonna go rather quickly through this because I have done this presentation before. Um, so risk uh, from natural hazards have an extensive history in Chile, obviously. Um, so about 90% of the total population live in urban areas and of that population, 62% of them are living in cities of 300,000 or more. Uh, there have been many earthquakes throughout its history, um, and these, especially earthquakes, but there are many kinds of disasters that Chile, or na extreme natural hazards that Chile is afflicted by. Um, so they've had huge impacts on Chile and has subsequently ch uh, really shaped its governance as well as its traditions of planning. So how Chile has designed its uh, policy that influences the built environment. Um, just quickly, a few famous earthquakes. In 1906, there was one in Valparaiso, which led to the creation of the Seismological Service here. In 28, Talca, uh, which led to kind of one of the first really structured ways in which the country has tried to influence building structure and design uh, for um, earthquakes in particular. And then in 1960, in Bolivia, which was the most, the strongest earthquake ever recorded, um, and probably for a while will continue to be the strongest one. It's a super rare event. Uh, in Bolivia, it led to the creation of the Office of Emergency of the Ministry of the Interior, or ONEMI, which is their, their equivalent of FEMA. There were like a couple of iterations before, and then in 74 they settled on ONEMI. So I also want to talk about the most recent major earthquake to afflict Chile, Maule. It's, um, it was in 2010. Uh, it was an, a tsunamogenic earthquake, so that means that it, it was an earthquake that, because of the way that it occurred, uh, created a tsunami. Constitución was inundated by waves as high as 15 meters or 50 feet. So what's interesting about tsunamis is that they there are two waves, right? There's the actual impact of water, and then there's the flooding afterwards, um, which is kind of uh, it's not just like studying floods, it's like studying earthquakes plus impact plus flooding. Um, there was a loss of 500 lives and damage um, along the coast. It cost 300 billion US dollars uh, with a loss in GDP of 26% of that amount. Despite the 1960 earthquake, it was the greatest economic cost of a disaster to date. But it also led to a bunch of, the creation of a bunch of new kind of instruments of planning and governance. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch on this because these are kind of the forebearers of a lot of the work and the like institutions that I'll be working with as well. Um, 
so it was an international effort. The United Nations did an assessment of kind of the uh, vulnerabilities and exposure of infrastructure in the country and how that led to the cost of a disaster, right? Because I will get into it, but not all hazards are disasters. So uh, this I just wanted to do a little overview because a lot of people tend to get the ideas of risk disaster and hazards and vulnerability confused, and of course it is confusing, uh, but in terms of generally how the field is looking at risk assessment, it's a combination and interactive effect between uh, natural hazards, vulnerability, and exposure, which is more like exposure to um, critical infrastructures like roads, you know, electric lines, power grids, things like that, and then of course historical recurrence. So Chile, there's a lot of historical recurrence here, so that would have a huge impact on the assessment of risk in the country. This can all be mitigated through, um, it can be mitigated through many, many different ways, uh, but one of the ways that I'm looking at is in morphology, which is essentially the design of the layout. It's kind of like design, urban design, but at a slightly larger scale on how the city is shaped over time. A lot of, huge instrument for this is through land use. There are other ways in which uh, planners can uh, support risk mitigation. Obviously this is an oversimplification because risk and resilience are very complex and I think it's worth noting because there's a lot of really interesting research from so many different fields that consider risk, which are all very important. You know, One is like the social solidarity in a community is a major indicator for success post uh, event. So I just wanted to make that note because it's not all about infrastructure. Social infrastructure is also infrastructure. Okay, I just mentioned this. Disasters are not natural hazards. They're socio-natural in nature. Risk is a vulnerability. Um, and urbanization processes largely shape the co social construction of risk and its response to future change scenarios. So morphology, again, in investigates the form, layout, and distribution of the city and processes behind its formation. So, uh, hopefully you can see it a little bit. Just a project overview. I'll be conducting morphological analysis in a, the mid-sized city of San Antonio for the purpose of validating and testing methodology in Sihiden's disaster research workflow, or DRW tool, called ASISTE, which is something they're actively working on. It stands for Seismic Tsunami Evacuation Analysis. As he says, the overarching objective, objective is to establish a conceptual framework uh, linking instruments for land use planning with the state of the art and hazard modeling, and thus burgeon and standardize strategic planning for risk mitigation in Chile. Um, my section of this project, however, will be to generate three land use change scenarios using machine learning technique in JS called the Land Transformation Model. Um, I'll then run these scenarios through both the Siste platform, which they're actively creating, as well as a complementary workflow system called the Regional Resilience Determination Tool, which is actually an American tool. Uh, it's part of the NSF-funded NERI, which is funny because it's very similar to like an American CIHIDEN, um, which stands for the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure. Just to give you a little like I guess this was a, a, this paper in particular was a major inspiration for me. Um, so this is kind of what it would look like in terms of generating three scenarios for design or potential layout uh, throughout the city and then running these through this their assessment tool, their flood modeling tool, is in order to test a methodology by which planners can say, okay, here are three potential designs. How can we actively run them through the system and a process by which they can evaluate the success of a design uh, obviously with certain uncertainty quantifications integrated, but still with a certain amount of confidence assess the success of a design. So they talk about three different, you know, scenario permutations as well as like, um, in this one actually it's the intersection of flooding as well as pollution. So they were looking in Tampa and um, it was that disastrous risk rate, which is usually an intersection between two major hazards. Yeah, so just a little bit more about ASISTE because this is a larger research project that I'm connecting into. I'm very fortunate to be able to work with. Um, they're actively working on this uh, to conduct analysis. It's a platform to conduct analysis 
and visualize seismic tsunami evacuation results um, in coastal cities in Chile. They're largely focused on the intersection between earthquakes and tsunamis because tsunamis are some of the worst disasters out there. It's like one of the most hazardous events ever. Um, they also have an ongoing pilot set in the city of San Antonio, which is why my research is set there. Their objectives, I already mentioned this, but they've like, this is their explicit stated objectives. It's to standardize risk assessment, um, to define minimum standards for risk studies required by um, IPTs or instrumentos de planificación territorial, which is territorial planning instruments, and establish a basic conceptual framework to link uh, these different instruments. So my pr particular research objective, uh, kind of within this project, is to support a methodology for developing data-driven appraisals of the cost of non-resilient growth. Uh, the holy grail, of, this is a highly ambitious part of the project. I, all of this is subject to change. But um, the holy grail of this, this style of research is to build more a more reactive decision support tool at the neighborhood scale so that you can build capacity for local planners uh, who know the area really well who are you know, plugged into the historical significance of an area, um, but maybe don't have the same kind of like technical skills to, to use the state of the art in the science in order to support their planning. So this is just a way to build capacity. This is characterized as geodesign by leveraging data in order to help with design. Okay, it's so a little bit about ASISTE, it's just risk assessment methodology, the risk metrics calculation engine, and then they're putting that into a visualization platform. This goes back to that equation I, I spoke about before, it's hazard exposure and vulnerability. This is part of their official documentation for the ASISTE platform. Um, so, yeah, they talk about probability that an intensity will exceed a threshold. Uh, Georeference and simplified model, the characterization of elements, systems of people exposed, and then state of damage or expected losses. Um, and that all comprises risk. Additional tools, I talked about using the land transformation model. It's a type of land use change modeling tool to predict future land uses using a machine learning process known as the artificial neural network in GIS. It does this by analyzing with various degrees of certainty. Uh, the relationships between driving factors between urban urban growth and land use changes in the past. Essentially, it uses various um, data that <laughs> very spatial data, and essentially satellite images. And through this process, it uh, develops kind of again with some tweaking. It develops various land use change scenarios. Um, another good example to see it is this is exactly, not exactly, but this is very similar, this is from that Tampa paper, to what I will be doing, essentially like looking at urban growth in the past, uh, generating three assessments for business as usual, um, the growth as planned, so existing plans for the city's changes, which doesn't always occur, but is a possibility, and then the third will be resilient growth, so um, building in a way which is highly risk averse, um, and what that would look like, as well as how you can basically leverage these tools in order to retroactively be like, okay, actually how do we reduce the potential cost of an extreme hazard to under $100 million, or whatever it is. Um, and then running those scenarios through various, this is a sea level rise example, but there are other, obviously, examples that can be used and then generating with various degrees of certainty different possibilities of outcome. And that is my presentation. <laughs> to that. Actually, I think I was on time. You're right on time, yeah, that's oh, great. We yes. have we even have time for questions. Nice. Which I'm sure there's lots of. <laughs> okay. So Any questions? Yes. Yeah, really interesting presentation. I'm so curious about your like risk and, and flood um, analysis, similar to like what I'm doing. Yeah, as yeah. we have discussed. But anyway, yeah, uh, I sort of like, uh, as phrase, it's like my head is the social construction of risk. So I'm wondering what, could you define that further or just discuss what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back actually to. So, um, yeah, risk is um, socially created, or it's, I guess, risk is the combination of. Um, vulnerability and exposure and
generally natural hazards. Like the thing that I want to explicitly say is that risk is um, not the same as expo like natural hazard exposure. So like you can live in highly exposed areas like the entire country of Chile, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, that doesn't necessarily mean an inability to adapt or react to a disaster or sorry to extreme events. Um, and I think a huge part of vulnerability and exposure are, have like multiplicative effects. So um, there, I think the best example I could say is that, I mean, we all know in Hurricane Katrina that that was something that was like going to inevitably happen. Louisiana is highly exposed to that specific kind of natural hazard. And there was infrastructure in place, so that's that's the exposure, right? That's like um, that infrastructure was heavily exposed and not maintained, which led to vulner, which led to ex additional vulnerability, as well as some of the most vulnerable citizens in um, in Louisiana living in the low lowest lands, and so that 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 comprises vulnerability, so some of the most vulnerable people living in the most vulnerable and highly exposed areas with infrastructure which is highly, um, which is faulty <laughs> and due to historical recurrence kind of has a magnified effect. Um, and that comprises risk instead of risk simply just being that, oh, these people should have known they live in, a, they live in Louisiana, right? Um, I think that when you consider natural hazards or when you consider disasters and risk as a socio-natural um, phenomenon rather than a completely sort of like random extreme event, um, then you have a much better chance of being able to consider possibilities for using design and policy and infrastructure to mitigate those risks. And I said briefly before that like infrastructure is not only hard infrastructure. I think something that professionals risk assessors now are thinking a lot more about and trying to talk more about is how social ties in a community, community is a part of infrastructure, right? Like the, the relationships and networks in a community is actually one of the most important pieces of infrastructure in responding to crises. So I think that when you consider you know, socio-natural, it also helps to like, forgive the bad word choice, it also sort of naturally brings in people who are trying to improve the conversation surrounding like leveraging design for social relationships or social infrastructure, which supports people throughout an entirety of a crisis. So that actually tends to be one of the most important parts of it. So yeah, that's, that's, that's that answer your question. <laughs> Thank yeah, you for the question. Uh, yeah, great talk. I was wondering like, uh, so do you keep like your model for this like tsunami, like constant or fixed and then you just like vary like the designs or like do you allow this like tsunamis properties or flooding to like change? And then you also like try to like, uh, take that into account? Yeah, so the tsunami modeling is based off of like, hmm, uh, the short answer is mm, not really. I mean, the tsunami modeling is um, sort of a regression based where it's like within a certain degree of certainty and it will change slightly every time. Um, the idea is that I'm conducting many like iterations of the same assessment, like many iterations of the same, I guess, scenario or simulation. And uh, that the consistency of the models uh, overlapping leads to a more accurate picture of what the, the mm. potential real scenario could look like within, of course, a certain degree of certainty, which is great because the quantitative side helps to generate the language to say, okay, we are this percent confident that a flood scenario would look relatively like this. Also, um, 
I didn't mention this before, but tsunamigenic earthquakes, there's a, actually a very specific way in which the earthquake needs to happen in order for it to generate a tsunami. It's not like all earthquakes in the ocean are going to cause tsunamis, such it has a subduction um, is the cause, right? So that helps to define some constraints, some, some shape to the models so that we can have a better accuracy. It's not like every single city on the coast is exposed. There are about 12 actually major cities along the coast which are exposed to this specific kind of risk. Um, but I also believe that the flood aspect of a tsunami model can be used in all along. So it's like all coastal cities are exposed to floods. Some are exposed to tsunami and some are exposed to other kinds. Right, yeah, I, yeah, I know we're over time now. a little bit over time, yeah. but, but I'm sure we'll have more time for your lunch. Sorry. This is fascinating stuff, you know. <laughs> I want to talk about community aspects as well. This is so oh, much yeah. fun. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back.